So this list of builds is going to seem pretty random. It's not gonna really be the most conventional or objective best builds in the entire game. And that's not to say that these are going to be bad at all. They're still going to be really good and overpowered builds. But at this point, I've made so many build videos and so many top five build videos covering so many different types of weapons. And I don't really like to make the same build multiple times. So for this video, I'm just gonna pick five weapons that I haven't really made a build video on and just basically just throw it in a video like this. Now I did try to actually have some variety on this list and not really have five of like the exact same type of build, but all of these are actually extremely powerful and I definitely recommend giving these ones a shot if you haven't already. But yeah, let's just get into it. The Grave Scythe is a high damaging strength based weapon, which obviously this is actually a scythe, so it's gonna get a pretty decent moveset and actually get some inherent and passive bleed. So to build around this, we're actually gonna go all into the strength stat, have at least 12 faith and 10 arcane for the Blood Flame Blade buff, of which this Blood Flame Blade buff is just going to add more bleed on top of the weapon, actually adds about 40 bleed per hit. So it makes the Grave Scythe have roughly around 100 blood loss build up, which is very similar to having like a high arcane occult infused Grave Scythe, but it's just going to end up getting more damage because it just scales better with strength. Now in terms of the infusion, we're actually gonna go with two different things. The main one that we're actually going to be using is spinning strikes. This is an absolutely devastating weapon skill. Some of my fastest boss kills have been with this exact Ash of War. Spinning strikes can just output so much damage with this build and do really fast blood loss build up. The helicopter attacks serve for amazing DPS. They don't consume much stamina. Very cheap for FP cost as well. And they do get follow-up inputs with this light and heavy attack that actually stagger enemies and get you some nice hyper armor. Which the major downside of spinning strikes in itself is that the helicopter attack doesn't get any hyper armor. You can get staggered out of it extremely quickly and it doesn't stagger it that well against those like medium sized enemies. But to counteract that, if we're actually gonna go fight those types of enemies, whether it be like a Lendel Knight, Clean Rot Knight, or even Millennia, I would actually recommend putting on Stormcaller because this one actually staggers and stun locks a lot better. It's not going to get as much damage or blood loss build up, but the stun lock potential can just make this extremely good. But against all other types of enemies and bosses, I recommend just sticking with spinning strikes because the gameplay is just speaking for itself. Now in terms of the talismans, we're gonna go with the Shard of Alexander, Millicent Prestasis, which gives you plus five to dexterity and more damage with success attacks, which obviously we're going to be hitting multiple times very quickly. I'm with the Ritual Sword Talisman because I'm always at full health. I don't really get hit that much, but if you're a person that doesn't feel that confident in staying in full health, I recommend us going with like a Damage Negation Talisman. And we're going to have the Lord of Blood Exaltation alongside the White Mask Helmet. Both of these things are just going to give us more damage every single time that we proc bleed right next to an enemy. Now, being that we're actually going into a bunch of strength, we're actually going to go ahead and use the claw mark seal because this actually gets a pretty decent in-kin scaling with a bunch of strength put into it, which if you're going to be at higher levels, I recommend just going into a little bit of faith. I went to 25 faith, so I can use things like golden vow, flame gummy strength. And if you actually did go up against an enemy that is resist to bleed, you probably could put something on like black flame blade, even though it's not really going to last that long. Now in terms of the wondrous flask, we're actually going to go with the strength based tier and the thorny cracked tier. That's just going to result in as much more damage. The thorny cracked tier works very similar to the Millicent Procesis, but actually just gives you more damage than that. Now one other like optional part of this build that's not really necessary is going to be the iron jar aromatic this thing just gives you like tier 4 hardness of which you can just tank so many attacks and actually give you a bunch of physical damage negation so if you actually are going to go up against enemies that do hit a whole bunch and give you very little openings and you still want to use spinning strikes you can actually go ahead and use this. Now, the unfortunate thing is that you do have to craft it a whole bunch. But as you can see, against certain types of enemies, you don't have to do anything. You can just hold onto the button, tank every single type of attack. Now, the unfortunate part of using this is that you can't really like roll or move very quickly, of which I would recommend just putting like Bloodhound Step on like a dagger in your back pocket and then switch to it whenever you actually feel the need to dodge. But yeah, this is definitely going to be one of the better scythe types of builds out there. The Godskin Stitcher is a heavy thrusting sword of which this weapon class has probably the best two-handed and one-handed moveset in the entire game. You get really quick poking attacks of which piercing damage is just absolutely amazing in this game. You do get the best running attack in the entire game. Those running heavies cover so much distances it's not even funny. You actually can use this alongside a shield and actually poke and block at the exact same time as you see in the gameplay. I'm not too big on shields. I don't really like to use them much but if you are struggling to dodge and you want to like learn a boss's moveset then I recommend just using a shield of which the bra shield is just going to be the best one to have. It's very reliable and actually gets you a lot of stability. Now the downside of the Godskin Stitcher is that you don't really get horizontal swipes. So trying to hit multiple enemies at once can actually serve as a problem. So if this is actually too big of a downside for you, I recommend going with the Great Epe. This one isn't going to be getting as much damage, but it does get those horizontal swipes for a heavy attack. So it can be a decent alternative. But the weapon skill of which we actually are going to have infused onto this is going to be Stormblade. This Ash of War is going to be one of the better ones in the entire game. It's not like incredibly high damaging, but it is so easy to use. It's so cheap and it actually gives you a bunch of benefits. It's only 10 FP for its first initial cast and then 6 FP for every successive one. And the animation is very fast. The projectile itself does actually go relatively far and projectiles that come out quickly and actually do some decent damage 
is just gonna cheese the entire game. Projectiles make this game so easy. And the, probably the best thing about Stormblade is actually does some decent stance damage and actually staggers a bunch of enemies as well. Like Lendel Knights, Omens, it staggers all those types of enemies. And also does about 10 stance damage just with the projectile. And hitting with this thing at point blank range is just going to do bonus damage because the weapon is actually gonna have a hitbox too. So honestly, you can spend this entire time just spamming this one skill. But for the build, we're basically just gonna go all into dexterity. It gets a pretty decent dexterity scaling. And Stormblade actually does scale in either strength or dexterity. And in terms of the talismans, we're gonna have Shard of Alexander for more weapon skill damage. Millicent Precises is not gonna be probably the most useful thing for this build. Build, you're not really going to be attacking that quickly with a heavy thrusting sword, but the plus 5 to dexterity is actually pretty nice. Ritual Sword Talisman was 10% more damage at full health. Once again, if you don't see yourself staying at full health much, I recommend just going with like a damage negation talisman. And we're going to have this spear talisman because we're doing poking damage. The counter attack damage is just going to be amazing and it's going to enhance it even further. Now in my offhand, I also do have a dagger with chilling mist. I recommend like almost every single type of build just having a dagger with chilling mist because it procs frost incredibly quickly. You could use it right at the beginning of the boss fight. It just does like 10% chunk health. And for the next 20 seconds, they'll just take 20% more damage. It's just a very solid deep buff that's very easy to use that doesn't require anything. Now as for my wondrous flask, I actually am going to have the dexterity and the faith base tier. Now the reason I have the faith base tier is because I do have 15 faith because 15 faith is just always amazing to have because you have access to flame grant me strength and at 15 faith you'd also have access to health regen spells and damage negation spells but using the faith tier while at 15 faith it boosts you to 25 of which you have access to more damage negation spells, golden vow, and better health regen spells. Now, if using spells wasn't that necessary to you, you could probably either go with the thorny cracked tier or the spiked cracked tier, whether or not you actually wanted to spam those charged heavy attacks or your weapon skill. And being that this weapon actually still can be buffed, you can pair it alongside some greases, although it isn't necessary. The Glintstone Chris is one of the best intelligence weapons in the entire game, and I consider it to be the best dagger in the entire game. The only reason why people don't really use it as much is because you do get it off a pretty annoying questline, but it doesn't change the fact that this thing can just absolutely decimate and melt everything. Its weapon skill, Glintstone Dart, is kind of just a beefed up version of Glintstone Pebble. It can go way further, do more stance damage, more damage in general, and you can fully charge it on top of that to make it go even further, even more damage. And with every single weapon skill that can be fully charged, you can just pair it alongside the God Freeze icon, and that's just going to result in 15% more damage. And just going all into intelligence, as you can probably see with the gameplay, yeah, things are just not standing a chance. Now, daggers themselves aren't going to be like the best primary based options because they don't really stagger that well, they don't have much range. And their DPS kind of is lacking when you compare it to things like curved swords or even spears. But there are some things that they actually do really well. And the main one being is going to be its critical damage that it does get. They tend to get very high critical damage. So when getting backstabs and reposts, it can just output a whole bunch. So we're going to try and go ahead and play into that. So the dagger we're actually going to have on our offhand is going to be the Missy Cord. Which this is going to be one of the better daggers in the game. It gets some pretty nice damage but it actually also does get the highest amount of critical damage at 140. Now we're going to have the Misery Cord infused with Glint Blade Phalanx, with obviously a magic-based infusion, because they're going to go all into intelligence, because both of these weapon skills are going to scale off that stat. No strength or dexterity really needed at all, because, you know, daggers have lower requirements. But Glint Blade Phalanx is going to be an amazing weapon skill to stance break enemies, because hitting with all of these projectiles does 40 stance damage, which 40 stance damage is like just as much as a fully charged Colossal Sword heavy attack. And you can just use this weapon skill before you actually engage into a fight and switch back to the Glintstone Chris, do the full Ash of War combo with that weapon. And that can also do 40 stance damage. So you're basically doing like 80 stance damage or close to 80 stance damage within like a few seconds. And every single time you get the stance break, you actually can just switch back to the miss record and just get the repost of what you're just going to output so much damage especially if you have the dagger talisman equipped. Now in terms of the rest of the talismans, obviously Shard of Alexander, 15% more weapon skill damage. And I'm going to go with the Magic Scorpion Charm too, which is going to be 15% more damage to magic, but it is going to make you take more damage too. So do keep that in mind. I'm also having this Spellblade set equipped is going to further enhance the damage of Glintstone Dart by a further 8%. So yeah, having all of these buffs all together can just trivialize this boss a whole bunch, but it doesn't just end there because obviously being that we're actually using an intelligence-based build, we can use some spells. This build doesn't really need spells because Glintstone Dart is arguably better than like all the other spells in the entire game, but we can use something like Terra Magica, which is just going to be 35% even more magic damage when standing inside of the pool. Gonna go with it as more Ice Storm too, because this spell actually procs Frost faster than anything else in the entire game. You can just fully charge it and enemies standing inside of it will get procced with Frost instantly, of which that is going to result in even more damage because they're getting debuffed. And then you can go ahead and pair that alongside Rani's Dark Moon, which this spell makes enemies take even more magic damage. And that's going to stack with all the other buffs and all the other debuffs you have going on. 
So yeah, I'm pretty sure this build is like self-explanatory as to how crazy it's actually going to be. Now in terms of the other spell options, I went with Carry and Piercer just to have like a nice range option that actually can stagger enemies pretty nicely. Magma Shot for enemies that are weaker to fire damage or just resist to magic damage and Rock Sling for a similar effect. And we're going to have the Carry and Regal Scepter because being above 60 intelligence, the Carry and Regal Scepter is going to be best. If you're earlier in the game, I recommend just going with the Meteorite stuff. It's just very easy because you don't have to upgrade it at all. And I'm just going to have a Dagger infused with Golden Vow because every single time that you don't have a faith based build I recommend is going with a golden vow infused dagger because it doesn't have any requirements it's very light so you can just switch to it at any point and then for the next 45 seconds you just get 10% more damage and defenses but in terms of our wondrous flask I'm obviously just going to go into intelligence and magic because those are the things of which our weapons are going to be scaling off the Raptor Talons is a very solid claw-based weapon, of which this weapon class is actually going to be one of the more underrated ones in the entire game. They have incredibly fast movesets, have access to slashing damage, high critical attack, they get passive bleed, and they can be power stance with just two-handing, meaning that you actually don't have to level up a second weapon just to power stance. Now, the Raptor Talons is going to be especially good because it actually does get bonus damage with your jumping attacks, and it does get a unique heavy attack too. That charged heavy attack does lunge pretty far and it does come out pretty quick as well so you actually can close the distance with relative ease now being that this one actually can be infused and actually does get passive bleed you actually can go into an occult infusion and upping your arcane will just further improve the blood loss build up to make it just proc bleed even quicker. Now this type of build is only really going to be better at later levels. If you wanted to use the Raptor Talons earlier on in the game, I recommend just going into a dexterity based build and pairing it alongside the Blood Flame Blade spell and it probably just end up performing better. But the benefits of actually having an occult based infusion with an arcane build is that one, you don't actually have to buff it at all. And two, you can actually pair it alongside a bunch of spells of which we're going to be doing that. The Dragon Communion Seal is just the best seal in the entire game because it just makes these arcane builds do really good spell damage. Now, every single time that I do go into an arcane build, I obviously recommend going into a little bit of faith because you have to meet the minimum requirements for some of these really good spells to use. I go into about 25 faith because that's like the minimum requirements for Golden Val and a bunch of other really good spells. Now, being that there's actually no arcane crystal tier, you can actually go ahead and throw in the faith tier, boost your faith to 35, and you can just meet the minimum requirements for even more spells. Things like Grail's Roar is going to be amazing. It's going to get boosted damage because you're using the Dragon Communion Seal, and it's going to debuff enemies to make them take more damage and actually do less damage. You can also use a spell like Scarlet Aeonia. It is pretty expensive in terms of its spell slots, but you can just use it right at the beginning of the boss fight, and almost every single boss in the game it is going to instantly get procced with Scarlet Rot. And the Scarlet Aeonia version of Scarlet Rot basically results in like almost 30% damage. But I also have spells like Dragon Ice and Dragon Maul. These are going to be like really solid dragon-based incantations. You can go like any which way depending on what boss that you actually are facing. But for like a melee ranged one, Dragon Maul is really good. And Dragon Ice I prefer because procking Frost is going to be really nice because this is going to result in them just taking even more damage. And I do have Frenzied Burst because it is like a nice, easy to use projectile option that can just snipe enemies from very far distances. And and then obviously going to have a gold of our and flame gaming strength to just further enhance our damage. But in terms of the Raptor Talons themselves, we're actually going to have this infused with Crag Blade. There's not many weapon skill options you actually can put with a claw based weapon, but Crag Blade is just going to be 15% more physical damage of which we're doing mainly physical damage anyway. And it is going to be doing 10% more stance damage, which with a claw, you're rarely going to proc a stance break anyway. But being with this build, the heavy attacks are so good and charge heavy attacks are still going to be the best way of doing that. It actually can serve as a nice benefit. So actually going to go ahead and pair this alongside the spiked crack tier and the Axe Talisman and just go all into a charge attack build. We're going to have the Millicent Prosthesis on because that's just going to help us do more damage with successive attacks. The Flux Canvas Talisman is going to give us 8% more incantation damage. And then we're going to have the Lord of Blood Exhortation Talisman and the White Mask Helmet. Both of these things are just going to make us do more damage when you proc bleed on a nearby enemy. And also to mention, I do have the Raptor Black Feathers chest piece. Being that the Raptor Talons actually does have higher motion values with its jumping attack, just pairing it alongside the Raptor Black Feathers is going to enhance the jumping attacks even more. So basically, Basically, with this build, you can't really go wrong with any single type of attack. The light attacks, heavy attacks, jumping, they're all going to work perfectly fine, proc bleed very quickly, and output high amounts of damage. The Sword of Night and Flame is one of the best weapons in Elden Ring, mainly because that it is actually the only faith and intelligence based option that you really have, but also because it does really good damage. It just melts so many bosses in this game. Now this weapon actually does get three different types of damage, physical, fire, and magic, which split damage to that extent is going to be pretty poor. It's not going to be the highest damaging straight sword in terms of like, you know, it's light attack combo, but its weapon skill is going to be where it really shines because you have the option to either pick a magic based projectile or a fire based AOE attack. The fire based one actually does do 
more damage, but does consume more FP and actually does serve as a horizontal swipe. So actually can hit multiple enemies at once. But the magic based version actually does go further and actually can send enemies flying. But with the correct setup, the magic based version can actually output more damage of which you're mainly going to be using the magic based version over the fire based one, unless you're fighting against an enemy that is weaker to fire damage. Now specking into intelligence is obviously going to improve the magic damage and inspecting into faith is obviously going to improve the fire damage. So if you really wanted to maximize your damage, going into one particular stat is going to be best, but having multiple different damage types on hand with the same weapon is obviously extremely beneficial because what if you actually go up against an enemy that's resist to magic and your fire based version is just not gonna really be cutting it. So I just recommend just going split even stats. I have 45 both intelligence and faith. You don't have to worry about any of your other damaging stats at all. Just meet the minimum requirements for your strength and dexterity and just go all into that faith int. Now the actual way to use this weapon is that you still want to commit to using one, just depends on the boss fight. So if you're going against an enemy that's weaker to fire damage, I recommend putting on the fire scorpion charm, the fire tier, the faith tier, flame grant me strength. These things are gonna further improve the fire base damage, but going up against any other type of enemy that's not resist to magic, I recommend just going with the magic based version because you can just output more damage because it is, has more buffs. Not only does it get the magic scorpion charm, magic tier and intelligence tier, but you also get access to Terra Magica, which is 35% more magic damage. You also get the spell blade set, which is going to be 8% more damage. And being that actually are going with a faith based build, you can go ahead and throw in Howl of Shibriri, which yes, is actually going to make you take 25% more damage or 30% more damage, but you're going to be doing about that much back anyway. So it does make it a bit more risky, but being that you're sitting at a longer distance, you kind of out of harm's way so it's not really that big of a deal but even if you don't have these buffs it's still going to be doing really good damage as you can see with the gameplay most bosses just do not stand a chance now in terms of the other talismans that i do have obviously shard of alexander just more weapon skill damage and with the ritual sword talisman for more damage at max hp once again if you feel like that you're never at maximum hp i recommend just going with like a damage negation talisman instead and i also have the carrying fairly good crest because these weapon skills can be somewhat expensive 28 and 32 fp respectively but the carrying fairly good crest can actually decrease that to 20 and 28. now being that we actually are going into a faith and intelligence build we might as well use spells now we don't really need to use spells because as you can see these two projectiles that we have with the weapon is just going to be more than enough but we do have access to to like a bunch of other status effects and all the other damage types. So if you actually go up against an enemy that is actually weaker to holy damage, you can use Discus of Light, which is going to be the best holy damaging spell. Really cheap, goes very far, can actually output some nice damage. And then when you go up against an enemy that's like weaker to lightning damage, I recommend just using Ancient Dragon's Lightning Strike. You could just use this all the time if you really wanted to, but I definitely recommend if you're going to go with this spell, definitely spec your build around this. So you actually use things like the Lightning Tear, Lightning Charm, God Freeze Icon, and probably have the Gravel Stone Seal in your offhand. But speaking of which, we're gonna have the Golden Order seal, which obviously this one is going to be your alone faith and intelligence based seal. And this one actually can output the highest amount of damage out of all the other seals, but people don't really use it that much because people don't really spec into faith and intelligence builds. And it also does give you boosted damage to your fundamentalist incantations, which will be like your holy based ones. And if you're going to be using that, I recommend just throwing on the gold mask helmet because you know, why not? Now in terms of the sorceries, unfortunately your staffs is not going to be good as the golden order seal. Golden order seal is like amazing from start to finish. The faith and intelligence based staffs are just not going to be that good. The Gelmir Glintstone staff is going to be the best one to have at 45 ints and faith. The Prince of the death staff is only going to be like decent when you get to like 80 int and faith. So the only spell we're really going to be using with the sorceries is going to be some more ice storm. It's just going to be a nice way to just proc frost very quickly. It's not going to be doing like the most amazing amount of damage, but that frost is going to be very nice and it does some nice stance damage too. So you actually can use this at the beginning of the fight, proc frost on the boss and then switch back to your main damaging things and just melt the enemy that way because it'll just be taking 20% more damage. So yeah, I did actually make this build sound more complicated than it actually is. But if you do want like a streamlined version, just go all into int, faith, Golden Val is kind of like the only buff that you really need. The only thing that you really need to switch if you don't want like too complicated of a build is it's going to be your Crystal Tears and your Talismans. That's really it. Anyway, that basically concludes the video. As always, let me know what your opinions are down in the comments below. And definitely do like and subscribe because I do have some more videos coming along the way. Whether it be build related or not, it's definitely going to be some interesting content. Anyway, catch you guys around. Bye.